Alcatraz Island One of the most secure prisons ever built, this maximum security federal penitentiary was located in San Francisco Bay to hold the worst of the worst. If anyone was going to get past the elite prison security, they would find themselves facing a perilous two-mile swim to shore in choppy waters. The prison was considered inescapable, with everyone who tried either being quickly recaptured or sinking to their death in the water below. Escapes had a 0% success rate, at least until June 11, 1962. Here is the story of what unfolded on that mysterious date day by day. October 12, 1933 The island had been in the hands of the federal government for decades, and it had a familiar purpose. It was a prison. The army had used it as a disciplinary barracks, and the isolated location was an ideal place for disobedient or reckless soldiers to take stock of themselves and reflect before being transferred back to their unit or dishonorably discharged. But it was also a barracks, not a maximum security penitentiary, and the government had no use for the standing prison when they acquired the land. They wanted to build something much more intimidating, and it would take almost a year to complete. August 11, 1934 the Federal Bureau of Prisons had spent the last year modernizing the place and turning it into one of the government's most secure prisons. It even had one of the first metal detectors ever added to a prison and radio equipment to keep contact with the mainland. Now all that was left to do was fill the prison with people it was intended for, and they had a specific population in mind. Alcatraz Federal Penitentiary was meant for the worst of the worst, the most dangerous criminals and the ones who kept getting into trouble at other prisons. It was designed as the end of the line. This was the day that the first boatload of prisoners would arrive on Alcatraz Island, transferred there from the infamous federal prison in Leavenworth, Kansas. Most were bank robbers, murderers, and even a few counterfeiters were mixed up in there. Within the next few weeks, hundreds more would arrive, and by the next year the prison would have almost 250 inmates. It would soon gain a reputation as the toughest prison in America, with inmate fights and even murders happening regularly. But the Bureau of Prisons was mostly fine with that, as long as the inmates stayed where they belonged, on Helcatraz. And they did, but not for lack of trying. April 27, 1936 It wouldn't be long before inmates tried to escape from Alcatraz, and the first was convicted armed robber Joseph Bowers. The prisoner was on trash duty at the incinerator when he made a run for the chain-link fence leading to the shore. He was quickly cornered by the guards ordered to stop, and when he continued to climb, he was shot and died from his injuries in the fall. He did get off Alcatraz Island, just not the way he was hoping. But the hope for freedom is eternal, and soon another prisoner tried to make a break for the shoreline. December 16, 1937 It's important to learn from mistakes, and Theodore Cole and Ralph Rowe did not intend to wind up like Bowers. The two bank robbers knew each other from Oklahoma, and both were in Alcatraz because of their past escape attempts. These two had a much more effective escape attempt, filing through iron bars and sneaking out of the prison workshop on a foggy day when they wouldn't be seen by the guard towers. They leapt into the waters below, and the strong currents carried them away quickly, never to be seen again. While their bodies were never found, they never got near the shore, and it's extremely unlikely they could have survived. But just because you learn from past failures doesn't mean you succeed. January 13, 1939 There have been plenty of escape attempts in the years since, but none of them went anywhere. Prisoners would attack guards, break windows, and climb the roof, but they were all caught. The next prisoners to make a real run of it were a fivesome, Arthur Doc Barker, William Martin, Rufus McCain, Henry Young, and Dale Stamphill. They were all kept in the prison's most secure unit as a motley crew of gang leaders and bank robbers. One night they managed to escape the prison and head to the shore, and they were smart enough not to try to swim for it. They attempted to build a makeshift raft, and time ran out. They were cornered by the guards, their ringleader Barker was killed immediately, and the rest wound up in solitary confinement with a lot of time to reflect on their mistakes. But others would improve on their mistakes. April 14, 1943 There had been more escape attempts since, with one man even getting into the water and then quickly swimming back to the shore once he realized he was going to drown. But four men would soon get closer than anyone had. James Borman, Harold Marin Brest, Floyd Garland Hamilton, and Fred John Hunter planned their escape well. They cut window bars in the prison workshop and made flotation devices out of cans. After overpowering two guards and leaving them bound and gagged, they escaped, but could only take two of the four cans through the window. One of the guards got loose, blew a whistle, and alerted the other guards. One was shot, one was apprehended, and the other two hid out in a small cave on the island before they were found, bringing their escape attempts to an anticlimactic end. But maybe they were working harder, not smarter. July 31, 1945 John K. Giles was one of Alcatraz's more unassuming inmates, but he was actually a cold-blooded murderer and a train robber. He was transferred to Alcatraz after several escape attempts and wasted no time getting up to his old tricks. He knew swimming to shore was a no-go, 
so he spent time collecting pieces of an army uniform from the laundry room until he had a full uniform. At that point, he impersonated a soldier and boarded a ferry that would take him back to the mainland. The only problem? He probably wasn't the only person to think of that, and before departing, the ship's captain checked the passenger list and found they had one extra. Giles was discovered and sent right back into Alcatraz, making him the closest to an actual escapee so far. And things were about to hit a boiling point. May 2nd to the 4th, 1946. No one had been able to get off Alcatraz Island yet, but six hardened criminals weren't going to let that stop them. Bernard Coy, Joseph Kretzer, Sam Shockley, Clarence Carnes, Marvin Hubbard, and Miriam Thompson were all serving long sentences when they overpowered correction officers and took control of the cell house. That gave them access to two things no previous escapees ever had, weapons and keys. They planned to steal a boat and head back to shore, but they soon discovered the keys to the outside door weren't included in the set maybe to prevent this exact situation. So they decided to fight it out. In what would become known as the Battle of Alcatraz, they took two guards hostage and both wound up dead. Three of the criminals were treated back to their cells while the others stood their ground against US Marines and were all killed. Maybe Karn, Shockley, and Thompson hoped that they'd be able to avoid blame if they went back to their cells, but all three were put on trial for murder of the guards and two went to the gas chamber, while the youngest, Carnes, was given a second life sentence. It was clear how bad things had gotten and the authorities were going to crack down. September 28, 1958 There had been only two recorded escape attempts in the 12 years after the Battle of Alcatraz, with one criminal managing to get out of the prison but just wandered around on the rocks after he realized he had no way to get to the mainland. Then on September 29, 1958, two inmates hoped it was their time for success. Aaron Burgett and Clyde Johnson overpowered a guard and jumped into the water using improvised flotation devices, including plastic bags they hoped would float and wooden boards that they thought would work as fins. It made a little sense, but it didn't really work out. Johnson was quickly nabbed by the police and Burgett drowned in the attempt. It seemed all but impossible to get off Alcatraz. Don't tell that to these guys. Let's wind the clock back a little, because four inmates were about to take Alcatraz by storm. 1957. Alan West was up to no good. The New York City-born had been arrested over 20 times through his life, and he was only 28 years old. He was currently serving an extended sentence for car theft at Florida State Prison, but his attempt to escape there put him on the government's radar, and he was soon sent to Alcatraz, becoming inmate AZ-1335. He spent the first few years there in relative obscurity, but he was about to get company. January 20, 1960 Frank Morris had a rough life, being abandoned by his parents when he was 11, but he went into the system and was shuffled from one foster home to another then got involved in crime by the time he was a teenager. By the time he was on the cusp of adulthood, he was notorious for drug possession, armed robbery, and any other crime that was easy to pull off. As an adult, he would escalate and begin stealing cars and robbing banks, which would lead him to the Louisiana State Penitentiary. He was serving a 10-year hitch when he escaped and was apprehended while committing a burglary. On January 20, 1960, it would be Alcatraz for the crafty crook who had reportedly had an IQ of 133, making him one of the smartest people in the prison system. But two minds are better than one. January 10, 1961 The Anglin brothers, John and Clarence, never had to worry about being alone. They were two of 13 children born to a family of farm workers who moved frequently. The two brothers were close and were expert swimmers, but they also had questionable judgment starting with Clarence breaking into a gas station as a teenager. By their 20s, they were robbing banks and businesses, and they were good at their job. They usually targeted closed businesses and rarely used guns, but when they robbed a bank in Alabama, they were hit with 35-year sentences. They tried to escape multiple times, so it was off to Alcatraz for the Bad News Brothers on January 10, 1961. But the prison didn't realize these four ingredients would make for an explosive mix. December 1961 The four inmates may have had very different backstories, but they all had met each other during the previous stays at prison in Florida and Georgia. And when they were placed in adjacent cells during their time at Alcatraz, it was like a class reunion. This gave them a lot of time to plan, and that's exactly what they did. Frank Morris, the most ambitious and ruthless of the criminals, took the leadership role and would spend the next six months carefully carving out an escape scheme. Literally. So how did they pull this off under the nose of the guards? For one thing, Alcatraz is big, and the whole thing can't be guarded at any given moment. As long as the prisoners are in their cells, the guards are likely to leave them alone. Most escapes have started from the prison workshop or yard anyway. And that's what gave these four their opening. They would collect scrap blades from saws that they found in the prison workshops and smuggle them back to their cells. They would also steal metal spoons from the cafeteria, and they even managed to improvise an electric drill from the motor of a vacuum cleaner. And slowly but surely, they would widen the ventilation duct in their cell until it was big enough to squeeze through. So how did these months of work go undetected? 
These crafty cons thought of everything, using the supplies from the prison workshop to paint cardboard that would cover the ventilation ducts, and as for the noise their work would cause, they had a plan for that too. Frank Morris loved to play the accordion, and as we all know, an enthusiastic accordion player can empty a room in a hurry. There was a designated music hour at Alcatraz, and Morris would play his heart out, while his partners in crime would work themselves to the bone, and their plan had one more surprise. They would need a lot of supplies to get away, and they didn't just try to assemble them in their cells. The vent ducts would lead to the top of the cell block, which was vacant. There, in the dead of night, when no one was watching, they would set up a workshop far out of sight and use a collection of supplies they had stolen. They were building life preservers, a far more effective way of surviving the raging rapids surrounding the island than a standard raft or just swimming for it. And the source of many of these ideas, Popular Mechanics magazine, which would no doubt be banned at Alcatraz in short order. And there was one more surprise in store for the guards right out of Hollywood. These four men were master craftsmen, and they knew that they'd need as big a head start as possible. Most of the past escapees were eventually tracked down, so these guys used their supplies to craft paper mache heads of themselves out of soap, toothpaste, concrete, and toilet paper. They then put the heads at the front of each of their beds, piled blankets and clothing under the covers, and made it look like they were sleeping there, a common trick that teenagers use when sneaking out of the house, but not nearly this effective. It was time to make their move. June 11, 1962 it was time to escape, but there would be problems from the start. The Anglin brothers and Frank Moore slipped through their corridors and into the ventilation shaft, but Alan West found his construction had a problem. He had used cement to shore up his corridor and it was hardened, making it just a little too narrow for him to slide through. He had to do an impromptu construction job and by the time he got through, the other three had departed, so rather than try to go it alone, he went back to his cell and fell asleep. The other three would have a more exciting night. The trio planned to escape through the unguarded utility corridor, and it was empty as they knew it would be. They then entered the ventilation shaft and climbed onto the roof. Guards who were interviewed after the escape attempt said they heard a loud bang but decided not to investigate. The trio carried their life preservers and raft with them, slid down a kitchen ventilation pipe, and made their way to the grounds. Now there was just one thing standing between them and freedom. Two 12-foot barbed wire fences. No biggie, right? They got over the fence, likely a painful ordeal, and worked their way to the northeast shoreline of Alcatraz Island. This was near the power plant powering the prison, which was a small blind spot in the island's security network. Hiding from the massive number of searchlights and towers with armed guards, they inflated their raft with an accordion-like device called a concertina they had stolen from an inmate. That's right, for the second time, accordions were responsible for the best Alcatraz escape attempt of all time. It was now around 10 p.m., and it was now or never. The three men boarded their raft with the safety equipment they had designed and launched it into the rough waters. Their goal was nearby Angel Island, an island two miles away. While it had been used as an immigration station previously, the island was mostly unspoiled wilderness and was the ideal place to hide out and plan their next move to the mainland, if they got there. They had two miles of choppy water to get through on a makeshift raft, something that no other escapee had ever survived. So, did they make it? We don't know, because Frank Morris, John Anglin, and Clarence Anglin were never seen again, alive or dead. June 12, 1962. It was morning and all seemed quiet in Alcatraz Federal Penitentiary. All the prisoners were sleeping, but three of them didn't rouse when woken up. A quick investigation of the cells ensued, and the dummy heads and ventilation ductwork were finally discovered. An exhaustive search of the prison ensued, and none of the trio were found anywhere. Federal authorities were called in to comb the area for any sign of escapees. After all, Alcatraz was inescapable, wasn't it? June 14, 1962. The investigators had found nothing for two days, but the Coast Guard finally had some luck, picking up a paddle around 200 yards off the coast of Angel Island. Was it debris from a wrecked raft or a remnant of a successful escape attempt? A look around the island found a wallet belonging to one of the Anglin brothers, but no sign of the trio could be found. The remnants of the escape would continue to be found. June 21, 1962. Near the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco, shreds of what would later be identified as a raincoat were found floating in the water. Raincoats were one of the materials used to build the raft, and this led the authorities to believe that the men likely had drowned, especially after a deflated life jacket was found the next day. But that was the last bit of physical evidence found by the authorities. July 17, 1962. The SS Norafjell, a Norwegian ship, was sailing into San Francisco Harbor when it spotted what looked like a body in the water. They weren't on the hunt for men and didn't report it until later, but many had speculated that it could have been Morris or one of the Anglins. However, authorities said it was unlikely a body would still be floating on the surface a full month after the escape. A man had died in a plunge from the Golden Gate Bridge only days before, so all this did was add to the mystery. 
Fortunately, the authorities had another source. When West's cell was tossed in the aftermath, his role was discovered, but he technically hadn't tried to escape and wasted no time telling the authorities everything he knew, so he didn't wind up being charged. With no confirmation of what had happened, the FBI put out wanted posters and offered rewards for the trio, while acknowledging they were likely dead. But just because no one knew if they survived, that didn't mean it wouldn't inspire others. December 16, 1962 Surely, a possibly successful escape attempt would mean a crackdown on the prisoners, right? Maybe not, because it would be less than six months until the next escape attempt, and this one also improved on the last guys. John Paul Scott, serving 30 years for bank robbery, created a pair of water wings for himself out of inflated rubber gloves and used them to bolster him as he swam to shore. He made it to the Golden Gate Bridge, where he immediately collapsed from exhaustion and hypothermia. Turns out, swimming two miles in December was not a great idea, and after a hospital stay, he was returned to Alcatraz. But there would be one other casualty of the escape attempt. March 21, 1963. Yes, Morris and the Anglins were likely dead, but no one could prove it, and that was a massive black eye for the inescapable Alcatraz Island. With the prison no longer looking as foolproof as it did before, the government turned a closer eye to it and discovered that it was a disaster. The isolated prison was very expensive to run, costing more than three times as much per inmate as a federal prison in Atlanta. Additionally, being a prison on an island surrounded by salt water took its toll, and much of the prison's construction had eroded. Massive repairs would be needed, but instead, Attorney General Robert F. Kennedy chose to close the prison, and today was its last day. Most of Alcatraz's inmates were lifers or had decades on their sentence, and they'd be transferred back to the mainland. In the end, everyone did escape Alcatraz, including Alan West, just not the way they'd hoped. But there were a few other postscripts to the whole affair. 1978 Alan West had a rough time before his stay on Alcatraz, and it continued after. He was transferred to different highly secured prisons before being released in 1967, and was arrested a year later for grand larceny. While in Florida State Prison, he murdered another inmate and died in prison of peritonitis in 1978, bringing an end to the story of the Alcatraz 4. Or did it? December 31, 1979. It had been 17 years since the escape, and the FBI was ready to close its file. No further evidence had been found since the days after the escape, but enough of the raft had been found that the FBI believed the men had drowned after the raft fell apart, and their bodies were likely swept out to sea. However, tips continued to pour in claiming sightings of the three men, making them the predecessors to the legendary plane hijacker D.B. Cooper. While the case was closed, the U.S. Marshal's file on the men remains open, and rewards are available for their capture. The story will only officially close in 2030 as the men would all be 100 years old and likely dead. Why were they trying so hard to escape? Watch why you wouldn't survive Alcatraz Prison, or check out this other video instead.